Greetings in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Good morning. It's an honor and a privilege to be here and share the very word of God to you. This last weekend, almost Friday and Saturday, we were at the Museum of the Bible, my wife and some people from our office, Concordia, Missouri, with some pastors, friends, district presidents, and church leaders. It's an amazing collection of story to see how God is word in the hands of millions preserved electronically and also in a written form, this very incarnated word, Christ himself, is present in the midst of that side of the world. Yesterday night when we arrived here at Kansas City Airport, my wife and I were like seeing each other, it, it is cold over here. <laughs> <laughs> because we left Winter Garden in Florida, it was really warm. Then she had stolen all my jacket and everything and we said, okay, you know, this is the Midwest, almost the Midwest. And <laughs> It's getting even colder, um, but interestingly enough, when I came here to see the two texts from the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts, chapter 8, verses 26 through 41, it just enlightened me. Because there we find one is going to Jerusalem and doing his annual ceremonial, ritual situation and going back to Ethiopia via Gaza. I mean, we hear about Gaza, don't we? Then here are two disciples who have been discouraged, who have been tired, who have been frustrated, and they were confused. They didn't believe what happened. They were going outside of Jerusalem to Emmaus. And they were talking, talking about what happened in Jerusalem. Then all of a sudden, they met a stranger. And he joined them on their way. Then he conversed with them. That's what the, the text said. He conversed with them. The more they talk and they were trying to ridicule him, don't you know what happened? Are you a stranger? Then the more the conversation went, their eyes started open. Of course, when they dip in that same dish, and their eyes even opened bigger, transformed, and they could see their hope, the resurrection, and the power, Christ, himself sitting, Christ himself walking along with them, sitting and eating with them, and sharing their discourage and struggle. Here is the irony we have. We found the text from the book of Acts, chapter 8. I believe you know this text very well. Here it talks about the Ethiopian eunuch. Well, you could tell from my deep southern accent. <laughs> I lived in Alabama 18 years, but to never get close to south. But originally, by birth, I am Ethiopian. But I'm not a eunuch. And I have my wife here. And we have children too. And the Ethiopian eunuch was such an uh, amazing personality we find in this text. He, he, was, he was traveling from Ethiopia all the way to Jerusalem, from Jerusalem all the way back to Ethiopia, crossing the Sinai Desert, crossing Gaza, not once, but habitually, 
every year during the time of atonement. The Jewish and the proselytes, which means Gentiles who became Jewish, they come once in a year for atoning or forgiveness of their sins. They bring jewelry, they bring sacrifice, they bring gifts for the temple, and they felt their sins are forgiven and they go back again. It's a religious pilgrimage. Even today we have that, don't we? In the Muslim communities, they have Hajj. They travel to Mecca from all over the world at once in a year. And they collect all the sins of the neighborhood. And they go there and they throw that stone on that black rock. And the idea is all their sin is left and they are coming back again. Then their name changes, Haji, so and so. Haji means travel and return it back. It is a way how people are trying to find forgiveness, mercy, love. It's seeking, you know, there are seekers in our community, in our society. And sometimes even young people try to seek and shop around from church to church and place to place as if God is like locked somewhere and try to find it. The Ethiopian eunuch. He, he, he was such personality, an ideal symbol of natural man. Natural man. The natural man have eyes. He see reality, but hardly see the spiritual reality. The Ethiopian eunuch was not ignorant because he was doing what? Reading. And he was reading the Greek text of the Old Testament, which we call the Septuagint. He was not just reading a mere book, he was reading the book of Isaiah. He was reading Isaiah 53, in my opinion, the heart of the gospel is there. Through his wounds, we are what? Healed. His problem was he was not understanding what he was reading. I just want you to have the context. If you read the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 23, from the Old Testament, there we find eunuchs. The word of God said, let eunuch no enter into your assembly. They are outcast. They should not be mingled to people. They are subhuman. They are treated like not a man. And that's in the Old Testament, chapter 23, right there. But here we find Philip, intrigued by the Holy Spirit and moved by the Holy Spirit. Touched by the Holy Spirit, seeking out this lost, confused Ethiopian eunuch. And going back to the text again, the book of Acts, chapter 8, it's an amazing text. It preceded by the Jerusalem Pentecost in the book of Acts, chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit descended and it was upon all the people, they started speaking in different tongues. And all the people who were under the same roof, breaking the bread in harmony with one heart, all of a sudden started speaking in someone's language. And they said, whoa, look at them. They speak our language. How did they learn? These are people from this side of the world. These are people from this side of the world. From Egypt all the way to southern part of Egypt, which is northern part of Ethiopia, all the way to Libya. 
There we find that small world and people gathered and everybody was talking. That is how God redeemed the language we knew from the book of Genesis chapter 11, from the Tower of Babel. When people tried to seek God and find out his whereabouts and God was laughing at them and mixed their language and dispersed them all over the world. Then the Lord brought them back, redeemed that language, connected his son Christ Jesus so that they all speak about who? Jesus. Then the story continues, and of course, when you have time, read that, and then we find the Samaritan, Pentecost. And the Samaritans, the Samaritans were also the most despised because they always think God is in the mountain. You remember the Samaritan woman in Jesus? Oh, you worship there and we worship this. Oh, our God is like that, your God is like that. And the Samaritans were really hated by the Jew community. But God crossed over that barrier and reached out to the Samaritan by bringing this very word of God, Christ himself. Then the third phase of the context of this book, you have the book of Acts chapter 8. Interestingly enough, we find the Gentile Pentecost. The Ethiopian eunuch was not a Jew, though he was a proselyte. He, he was living in the promise of the Old Testament. But Christ was still buried under the mud and he didn't understand. He had a religion and a religious mask, but Christ was not seen. As we are approaching Reformation next week, I'll be in Illinois preaching at Holy Cross in Quinesville. As people who are touched by the Spirit of God and ransomed by the Spirit of God and the Word worked in our lives as it worked in Martin Luther's life, once his eyes were open, Luther said, What? Here I stand? Dear beloved, that is the spiritual journey of the Ethiopian eunuch. He had everything, remember. He, he, he had wealth and he had uh, people who are helping him out and uh, driving his chariot and perhaps so many bodyguards. And he had treasures because he's a treasure in our today's terminology. He's secretary of treasury. Influential man. He was lost in the wilderness. He was lost in the wilderness to Jerusalem. He was lost in the wilderness of the temple life. He was lost in the wilderness of that religiosity. Maybe that is the case for us. We are good Lutherans, are we not? We were born in the Lutheran Church, perhaps most of us, in the Lutheran Church of Missouri Synod. And we may have the best cross we bear, and we perhaps know our confession and our church tradition, and we know why the pastor at the green, and we know why the altar cover is green. Sometimes when we miss one step during the liturgy, we could tell, ah, he messed up again. <laughs> we are really good. Don't worry, I'm part of that crowd. I was just like that Ethiopian eunuch. I'm going to tell you my story. Born and raised in Ethiopian Orthodox Church, Religion was very important for me. But Christ was hidden under the mat. 
going to church and I, I, I could do liturgy and a very good one. But the very essence of the scripture, the message of the Bible, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son to die for you. That was shattered from my sight. I could really tell you all the angelology and the iconography and all the historic and tradition because I was raised in that culture. But when it comes to the Bible, I don't know what I was reading. I was just like the Ethiopian eunuch because back in the days when I was a young man, Ethiopia was under the grip of the communists. When I hear sometimes young people, they just chat, they just talk about communism in Ethiopia or communism in the United States. I just say, oh, you have no idea what you are asking for. That was the time when Abby and I, young people, lined up for a loaf of bread, probably for the whole day. You start the line midnight, you may be lucky to get your bread by 9 a.m. in the morning. You are buying it, but that much. Everything was rationed. Horrible, terrible. All kind of civil war. Some of you remember about the Ethiopia of the 80s. You remember the poster child? You remember when singers like Stevie Wonder and Michael Jackson Bob Gildoff and you just named them. They came out and they said, we are the world. And you remember that song when they sang, do they know if this is Christmas? That was the generation I come from. Civil war, drought, famine, struggle. On top of that, our spiritual eyes were blinded, just like the Ethiopian eunuch. We have religion, we have beautiful cathedrals and crosses and wonderful history. I mean, I was talking, Pastor Wood, about how all this church, 90 year old, I mean, from our culture and our history, 90 year is just yesterday. Because the ancient churches we are talking about in Ethiopia are 1800, 1900 years old. It's beautiful cathedrals. But throughout century, tradition took over the power of the gospel. And the gospel was buried and were blinded. We're doing rituals and pilgrimage and religiosity. It was great, but Christ was hidden. But this is what happened. When I was 15 years old, a young missionary from Germany, Hermannsburg, outside of Hanover, came to my community. His name was Johannes Launhart, very tall German. And the chapel where we were, maybe half of this. He was preaching. He was preaching in Ethiopic, Amharic language. And I was listening to him. Very tall guy. I have never seen Caucasian in my life in person. I saw European playing soccer in World Cup. That's all I know. But here he goes. This guy was very tall and he stretched his arms like that. He filled that chapel. That scares me. I said, oh my God. Is he an angel or what's he doing? Then he preached the gospel. On his way out, he was bending down and shaking hands because most of us were short. And he came down to me and he whispered to my ear and he said, Wak jalata," which means in English, God loves you. That is in my mother tongue. And it just shocked me from my head to toe because how did he know this? Then he said, I'm, I'm going to give you something. 
Then he reached out to his bag and he gave me a black book. That was my first Bible. Then I ran to home and I started reading the Bible and talking to people and mentioning about his goodness and his gracious acts. And one thing I learned, I was a Christian, groomed to be a deacon in the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, reading the scripture using the old Giz, which was dead 1,000 years ago. Only priests understand that language. The rest of the people, they come to church, they go home. It's a mass. It's like in the Catholic Church when you have a Latin mass. The people don't understand what the priests say. That was exactly my life. But when the German missionary gave me the Bible, which was translated by missionaries, I could read. I could understand. My eyes opened. That changed my whole life and transformed me to be who I am today. Dear beloved, we all have a aha moment in life. Just like Luther had one, the righteous shall live by faith. That was a striking point for Luther and then he said, Who? What I was doing then all these years in monastery? And the same was true with me when I have my Bible and read it in my mother tongue. And the same is true for you when you read your Bible in English. English is probably with my academic language, is the fifth language. I try to communicate English to you. But imagine if you give me the Bible in my mother tongue and I read it, I don't even need to reference the book because I have it here. It's natural, very natural. Just what to say here. Like the Ethiopian eunuch, we could be lost in our own religious order, in our own religious world. We could be lost even in our own Lutheranism. Did I say Lutheranism? Even our own Missouri Synod Lutheranism. Easily, if we are not connected to the very Word of God, nourished and nurtured by the Word in the sacraments. But here is the good news we have. God availed that Word for you in various versions. Do you know how many versions of the English Bible you have today? Over 153 versions. Imagine. 153 versions of the English Bible. And the good news we have also, that same Christ, working through his word and sacraments, Stretching out his caring, loving, beautiful arms to you and I. Inviting us, saying, come unto me. I will give you rest. As we go to the Lord's table, as we sang in the beginning, that is exactly what happens. He will restore your life. He will restore your ministry. He will restore your community. He will restore your church. Despite we have confusions, despite we have challenges, Christ reigns and he reigns in our heart now and forever. Let the church say, Amen.